know the bombs, fragment, the bombs they found from the you, you find any from the wall. Oh my god. Oh, yeah. Wow. Rolling. Hi, it's EJ, and I know I look kind of silly with this mask on, but I feel like I look even more silly with this mask on and the beard, so just uh you know deal with it for this video. Let's get on with the show. Oh look, I'm surrounded by children. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm here in Badin Square in Hanoi, Vietnam, where Ho Chi Minh declared independence for Vietnam from the French colonial empire on September 2nd, 1945. Today, Badin Square is the location of the mausoleum, which serves as the final resting place for Ho Chi Minh. And I gotta tell you, it's a pretty heavy atmosphere here. The square is actually in a section of Hanoi which was heavily bombed by the U.S. during the war. And in fact, an unexploded bomb was found very near here just last year. It could have killed a lot of people, but fortunately they were able to defuse it. My point is, in so many ways, that war is still very much woven into the very landscape of this area. Now, during the heaviest period of that bombing, in December of 1972, over 80,000 tons of bombs were dropped on population centers of Hanoi over just 12 days. 4,000 civilians were killed, thousands more were injured, 5,400 buildings were destroyed, including five hospitals and 24 schools. This year marks the 50th anniversary of that bombing campaign. And looking back, I, I gotta say, I have a hard time wrapping my head around the struggle of the Vietnamese people during that decades long fight against fascism, colonialism, and imperialism. Like, how did they do it? How did they keep fighting? What kept the people of Hanoi from giving up when they were under constant bombardment? And many kept fighting even after their entire families were killed. Take for example, this story from the intro of the book, The Dialectics of Liberation, a collection of speeches from an anti-war event which was held in London in 1967. In that book, editor David Cooper relates this story. I recently met in Cuba a Vietnamese guerrilla commandant who talked about how while he was conducting an operation against the invading US and mercenary forces, he knew that his wife and three children were being slaughtered in the next village. He knew that, and yet he dispassionately and successfully carried out his military, counter-military work. This man acted by choice in a way that conscripted U.S. soldiers never can do. They simply lose and are lost to their families and can never give anything up. How did they do it? How did so many people, we're talking millions of people, fight and struggle over decades against such a seemingly insurmountable force, against the background of so much death and destruction? We're talking over two million civilian casualties. More bombs dropped by the USA than by all nations involved in World War II combined. Agent Orange and Napalm and flamethrowers and countless other inhuman atrocities. How did they do it? How did they keep their spirits up in the claustrophobic confines of the Coochie Tunnels, through the ceaseless terror of the Hanoi bombing campaign, in the midst of atrocities like the My Lai Massacre, how did they do it? I think one important aspect to consider in dealing with this question is what Ho Chi Minh called revolutionary optimism. According to Uncle Ho, revolutionary optimism is a very specific form of optimism rooted in material reality. Optimism, of course, is in and of itself just believing that things are going to be okay. Optimism isn't always a good thing. In fact, optimism can be a form of false consciousness, and it can be dangerous if it clouds your judgment or disconnects your mind from reality. So we have to distinguish somehow between revolutionary optimism and optimism in general. See, people with revolutionary optimism hold a belief in the bright future of the liberation of humanity. Importantly, revolutionary optimism has a scientific basis. That is to say, it must be grounded in reality. It must be rooted in our material conditions. It must not be unfounded optimism. The perception and understanding of the revolutionary about all things must be rooted in the material world. I have a video about this that very few people watched, but I'm actually pretty pleased with it. So you can check that out if you wanna learn more. But 
Back to Ho Chi Minh. See, he was a revolutionary optimist through and through. He never stopped believing that Vietnam would win its independence from colonialism and imperialism, but he was also a strict materialist. And his optimism was grounded in material reality. He knew that tremendous sacrifice would have to be made for victory. As he wrote in Wage Resistance War in 1946, we would rather sacrifice everything than lose our country than return to slavery. Men and women, old and young, regardless of creeds, political parties, or nationalities, all the Vietnamese must stand up to fight the French colonialists to save the fatherland. Those who have rifles will use their rifles. Those who have swords will use their swords. Those who have no swords will use their spades, hoes, and sticks. Everyone must endeavor to oppose the colonialists and save his country. This is part of what it means to say that revolutionary optimism must be grounded in reality. As revolutionists, our optimism must never devolve into simple wishful thinking or idealist optimism. We have to know from the get-go what's at stake and that we will face all sorts of trials and tribulations and that revolutionary optimism, therefore, will not always be joyful optimism. It will often be sorrowful. We must accept that through our struggle towards victory, all of us will suffer, sacrifices will be made, and many will die in the fight for freedom. Ho Chi Minh described the sacrifices made by the peoples of Vietnam in a letter he wrote in 1947 to the Viet Bac ethnic minority who helped in his fight against the fascist Japanese Imperial Army. I will never forget in those arduous days, the people of your province, the old people, the women, the peasants, the young people, the children were all enthusiastic to help. Tall people, noon people, Man people, male people. Some helped us eat, some gave us clothes. There were people who abstained from food and clothing, sold buffaloes, and sold their fields to help us fight our revolution. And I just want to pause for a moment and explain. You might not get the cultural significance of selling a buffalo or a piece of land for a peasant or a poor ethnic minority family in Vietnam at that time. That was a major sacrifice. That was literally their entire livelihood. So revolutionary optimism is sober optimism, which recognizes the limitations, the challenges, the struggles, and the sacrifices that have to be made for revolution. It is a matter of facing the facts and reconciling our dream of liberation with the harshness of reality. But if we can do that, if we can come to terms with stark reality and face the brutality of truth, then and only then can we equip ourselves mentally for the long and arduous struggle towards liberation. It is precisely because we understand the difficulties and dangers that lie ahead that we can face them with revolutionary optimism like Ho Chi Minh. And this indeed is what allows us to become revolutionaries in the first place. One major difference between revolutionaries and non-revolutionary folks is that revolutionaries are aware of the systemic nature of the oppression which humanity faces as well as the historical development of human society. With this grounding in the past and present nature of human society, revolutionaries are able to see farther and deeper into the future. Revolutionaries have a more profound understanding of the real world, and that is why they have a stronger faith that they can build a better world. It is this unique brand of revolutionary faith, a faith that's grounded in material conditions and historical development, which enables revolutionaries to overcome all difficulties and dangers in their lives and in their revolutionary struggle. And with such revolutionary optimism, revolutionaries have surmounted incredible odds and even willingly sacrificed their own lives to strive for better futures for their people. This is why I believe it's important for revolutionaries to become acquainted with history and with political theory and the dialectical relationship between theory and practice. Understanding our world and how it works and how we can change the world is critical. We have to know what is and is not possible. We have to measure and test our actions against reality to find out what works and what doesn't if we want our optimism for liberation to have any hope of actual success in the real world. Ho Chi Minh died in 1969, six long years before the victory of Vietnam against the USA and the puppet regime of South Vietnam. His last piece of writing was his will and testament to the people of Vietnam. When he wrote it, things were not looking good for the revolution in Vietnam, and it would have been very easy to believe that the revolution would ultimately fail. 
Yet Ho Chi Minh maintained his revolutionary optimism despite this harsh reality, even when he stood on the brink of death himself in times of such uncertainty. He wrote, our people's war against the U.S. and national salvation, although it has to go through more hardships and sacrifices, will definitely win completely. It's a sure thing. No matter how difficult or arduous our people will definitely win. The American empire must get out of our country. Our nation will definitely unite. The people of the North and the South will definitely gather in one house. Ho Chi Minh was certainly not the only figure in revolutionary history to practice revolutionary optimism. We can also cite the works of Che Guevara, Pyotr Kropotkin, Thomas Sankara, Rosa Luxemburg, and countless others. But one figure who I turn to again and again when I feel myself slipping into doomerism and doubt is Fred Hampton, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party, whose speeches embodied unbridled revolutionary optimism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. And we're going to have to put it back in the hands of the people. Socialism is the people. You're afraid of yourself. If you're afraid of socialism, you're afraid of yourself. We know they have our pictures. We know they're looking for us. We know they want us. But we're still saying that even though we couldn't be in a fit, as far as this system goes, on the mountaintop, we in the Black Panther Party because of our dedication and understanding what's in the valley, knowing that the people are in the valley, knowing that we originally came from the valley, knowing that our flag is the same flag as the people in the valley, knowing that our enemy is on the mountaintop, our friends are in the valley. We say even though it's nice to be on the mountaintop, we're going back to the valley. <laughs> You can't do it unless you believe that you can do it. Fred Hampton knew that there was every chance that he would die in his revolutionary struggle against the white supremacist state that oppressed his people. And indeed, he was assassinated in a hail of over a hundred bullets from cops while sleeping in bed next to his girlfriend who was eight months pregnant at the time. Hampton himself was just 21 years old when he died. In his short life, Hampton built up revolutionary optimism in the hearts and minds of countless other revolutionaries, as exemplified in one of his many inspiring cries, let's make history, let's take history. This is Li Tu Chong, and Li Tu Chong was the very first member of the Communist Party Youth Union in Saigon. And Li Tu Chong was killed, executed by the French colonial administration before he reached the age of 18. He gave his life for revolution, and he struggled throughout his very, very short existence on this earth. And like Ho Chi Minh and Fred Hampton, Li Tu Chong knew, he must have known, that he was up against what must have seemed like insurmountable odds. Indeed, it would be decades before his people found freedom. They had to struggle against the French colonial administration. They had to struggle against the Japanese fascists and then the might of the United States of America's Army, Navy, and Air Force. Just as Fred Hampton had to struggle against the entire force of the United States of America's law enforcement, which opposed the Black Liberation Movement through violence, which included the murder of Fred Hampton himself. But Li Tu Chong and Ho Chi Minh and Fred Hampton had one thing in common. They never stopped believing that their peoples would eventually win their freedom, and neither should we. Things are extraordinarily tough right now around the world. We're facing disasters, war, COVID, so many other terrors and threats to our very lives. It's easy to feel hope slipping. And yeah, I sometimes find myself slipping into doomerism, but whenever I start to feel that shadow of defeatism and pessimism creeping into my brain, I remember the sacrifices and the stands taken by comrades like Ho Chi Minh and Fred Hampton and Li Tu Chong, and it grounds me back into our material reality, and it rejuvenates my revolutionary optimism. After all, if the people of Vietnam could win their freedom against the full force of the most powerful war machine in human history, then we have to believe that we can and will eventually win our own revolutionary struggle. We can do it. But before we can do it, we must believe we can do it. I will leave you now with a passage from Ho Chi Minh's prison diary. He wrote these lines 
while he was in a cold jail cell somewhere in China. The worst is to be sick in prison. I could have cried, but I kept singing. Keep singing, comrades. We'll see you next time. Everybody in the state of Illinois is going to have to be involved or even around the revolution because we're going to have one. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to do more than talk. We're going to have to do more than listen. We're going to even have to do more than learn. We're going to have to start practicing, and that's very hard. We got to start learning, and you learn through practice. We got to start making mistakes, and you learn through making mistakes. We got to start getting out there with the people. And a lot of times we think we're better than the people, but that's an insult, and that's criminal. Think you're better than the people. We got to get together and learn where it's at. It's going to take a lot of hard work. That's better for children than something else. You ought to dig on it. All, every sister in this, in this, in this, in this, uh, in this audience. I'm saying every sister in this audience ought to get themselves together and come on down and help us that breaks the children program. Y'all to come down and help feed them children in the morning. We have breakfast for children because we teach the people through practice, through observation and participation, that people can be fed free. Carl f***ing Marx. Marx, Mario, Mario, Marx. This is a video about Marxism and Super Mario Bros. Finally, the intro's finished and we can get on with this friggin' video essay about Marxism and Mario.